Hi, everybody. Welcome to Library Con Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Yay, we're all here. I'm Marla Isaac. I'm the talent ladies on that image comics. And I have the creative team of Compass here to talk to us about their book. Very exciting. I'm just going to introduce everybody and then we can talk about Compass as a series and what's going on with it, how you feel about it. And then uh, we'll take some questions from the audience too. So everyone feel free to write your questions in the chat and uh, we'll go over those as we go along. I'll ask you some questions about the book too. Um, so yeah, first of all, well, Greg, you're to yes, my left. Marla. So you may introduce yourself if you like. I'm Greg Rucka. Um, <laughs> I write lots and lots of comic books and novels and uh screenplays now too and oh. the occasional video game and things like that that's cool i didn't know you oh, oh i should I'll, I'll specify uh from image lazarus the old guard black magic and there's a whole slate of stuff coming up that hasn't been announced yet and uh i am the best we can I guess the executive producer behind Compass would is yeah. that what we would call it? Yeah, I have my questions for you. We can get into that in a second, but I, yeah. I, I'm yes, yeah. I want to know what your role is here. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here, Greg? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm I'm feeding more meat into the comics publishing machine, as is my duty. <laughs> for my misery should be shared. No, um, yeah. carry on. Uh, Dave, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dave Walker. Uh, I do not write lots of comic books and screenplays, but I wrote this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that makes it seem like this is the first comics you guys have ever written, and that's <laughs> not true. That's not true. No, that is, um, that's not true. This is uh, this is the first that we have uh, manifestly muscled across the publishing line, but. Do not undersell yourself so so gravely as to make it seem like, yeah, I just decided one day uh, and look at me, I'm published by Image. Yeah, don't. People will come for you with knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Dave and Robert, do you also want to like, well, you three were also on um, Old Guard Tales Through Time. So you're back at That's it true. again. You had so much fun with that that you're like, let's do this all over again. And prior to that, technically, we were on the Lazarus source books, which is how we all got started. Right. That was the big hookup. Is right. that in point of fact, they're the primary reason there are Lazarus source books beyond the first one, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. We take all credit slash blame, which yeah. is probably more to the point. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've also, we wrote the, or substantial portions of the World of Lazarus role-playing game for Green Ronin. There's a few other bits and pieces out there with our names on it in various capacities. But, yeah. you know, compared to some of the superstars who I'm sure you've heard from today, including some on this call, uh, we <laughs> are in the early phases of what is hopefully a, a, a long time doing stories for you guys, but we'll see how we go. Wow. Is there going to be a source book for uh, Old Guard or Compass, can you can you disclose that <laughs> that face? Uh, wow! <laughs> all eyes turn to Greg. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't executive I don't see, producer Greg. Rekha. I don't see a, an Old Guard source book. I think that would actually kind of hurt the Old Guard. Mm. Depending on the future of Compass. Um, and the beauty of Compass is the, the pulp fantasy that is born out of the, the historical seed and the extrapolation means that there, I mean, literally the world is your oyster in, 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 in the land of Compass. So yeah, we, I, I have heard these two gentlemen talking about the, the next possible story and the shorthand was Phantom of the Opera in Athens um, was, was what I caught. And I was like, okay, so if you guys can okay. do that and make that work, all bets are off. Wow. Um, yeah. So we will see right now, you know, the future of Compass is, as with all things, uh, contingent on um, market forces and time. Yeah. Um, 
but there is absolutely passion and interest and we should you know there, there's there's the other unspoken member of this crew who isn't here right now who's who's artist justin greenwood justin, yeah yeah uh and justin has already made it very clear that he will happily come back and play so. oh great I'm also talking too much. They wrote it. I just no, say it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So that was what I was curious about. So you two wrote it, and Greg, you co-created it. The three of you together, you all co-created it. Is that what's going on? I'll I'll, I'll start and let them correct. <laughs> um, sure. So okay. I, I I've known these two for several years. They are absolutely friends. This is one of those rare instances with being friends with a, a, somebody who has published paid out for them, um, but it paid out for them because I had been seeing their writing in multiple places and also had been hearing these story ideas. And the idea for what ultimately became called Compass, uh, I was smitten with. I felt this wasn't just good and fun and also a great story to tell in comics, but it was also, I felt, it, and it's a tired word, but I felt it was important. Um, mm. You know, we are all painfully aware that you are looking at three white guys here. Um, but to tell this story in the period that it was told where the two leads are not just women, um, and not just women, quote unquote, of color, but, you know, one is a, is a Muslim woman mm -hmm. um, and is our hero, is a young Muslim woman. And her frenemy, you know, is uh, from a Chinese merchant family. And again, based in sort of enough fact of the history, um, I felt we needed to get this out there. So... I put my shoulder behind it. And primarily that was me putting them together with Justin and then me beating the snot out of them on their scripts um, and, and making sure that we were doing it as best as we could. And I will sit back there and, and, mm -hmm. and let them tell the tale, but yeah. Yeah, Robbie. I as in how we put it together or how we all got together, because those are, are, are relatively separate stories. I can see in the chat bar that it's been thrown out. Why did we set it around the Islamic golden age and, and how did that get started? Um, and the answer to that is that we sort of started with a negative. The negative spaces is really where we, we began. So the first instance was thinking about, I guess, the genre of the pulp adventure story. Uh, the thing that actually kicked it off was, and this is many years ago now, when Disney bought Indiana Jones and mm -hmm. went, we are trotting Indiana Jones out again. And look, I love Indiana Jones. I, I, I mean, I really love Indiana Jones. But I kind of went, ooh, Harrison Ford's getting old. There's <laughs> got to be a way to do this that is not linked to an 80-year-old man. And particularly paired to that, the idea that, you know, I was reading a thing the other day uh, about an analysis of Shelley's poem, Ozymandias. And the point about that is, as is a known quantity, but this draws it to mind, that of course, pre-Rosetta Stone and pre-Egyptology, nobody had a sense of what was actually going on in ancient Egypt at all. So the period that we think of for archaeologists digging stuff up is basically a period from about 1860 to about 1930. And that is a tiny window of world history, comparatively speaking. And so the minute you zoom that out and you start to think, well, where else were people exploring? Where else were people relic hunting? Where else were people figuring out what was under the surface of the world and spin that on its axis to think about where that is going and where that is coming from? Well, there's all kinds of historical examples that come to mind. And the first one that we thought about was the House of Wisdom, which is really the, the, the nidus of the story, is that we, we knew that that was one of the great periods of exploration, but we also knew that that was exploration that lacked, I guess, what we would call the colonial context. So it wasn't, mm. we're going to land and conquer because and Baghdad, and take, ba which is not to say that, that Baghdad was not, 
you know, although the caliphate as, as a whole was not an empire like other empires. It's just fundamentally it was set at a center point of world trade, of world academic and invention and scientific knowledge. It was surrounded by some significantly militaristic powers and nevertheless made, managed to become this cosmopolitan economic academic powerhouse. And so taking that and going, these are people who explored the horizon. These are people who made maps. These are people who tried to understand what the rest of the world was like removed from that cosmopolitan context really helped us feed into if we want to do an adventure story, this is the best place to do it. Mm. Uh, nice. And then, then Dave said immediately, the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dave immediately said, we need to make this fun. We need a, 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 mm. a Han Chinese relic hunter who is uh, on you know, it can't all be rarefied academics doing the best possible thing or you'll turn it into a lecture series. Yeah. Uh, and so we sat down and nutted out the first kind of what became the first seven pages of the issue have existed for years upon years, that opening in issue one, and then the rest of it kind of filled out from there. Wow. That research must have been so much fun, though. Oh, it's great. Thing. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, part of the pleasure of it is you can chuck a rock and hit any point in history and if you dig a little bit under the surface you find connections and you find little secrets and there's all kinds of elements of synchronicity about doing whales where the timeline lined mm. up perfectly we didn't need yeah. to do things to make that work we just looked around and went well what's happening in this particular year and a perfect storm and then we wow, found that's so great that's yeah, the best thing about creative research as opposed to you know academic research or trying to actually solve a mystery is you can just throw that rock right you, you pick anywhere to start you say what is happening in Cardiff or you say what is happening in Athens you pick a year and you start looking and you are never more than a few steps away from something entirely wild and entertaining that will pretty quickly lead you to a good book or a fantastic piece of art that you can look at and go yes I can do something with that. That is cool. We can work with that. There's a lot. It, yeah. It's interesting because uh, there was a question on the old guard chat we did this morning about research and so on. And, and the fact that good research will lead to good story. Mm. Um, and that the trick is to use the research to influence the story you're telling and to find those things in the research that will serve your fiction but that if you are researching properly, you will, nine times out of 10, I really believe this, you'll find more use in fact um, that will propel the story and, and aid you than will impair it, will be things like, okay, I have to ignore this or rewrite it, so. I like to think of the like golden age murder mysteries, like the Agatha Christie's and so on, and the research they put into those in the, you know, these things, in a sense, become kind of your your rules, almost like a game mm. that, that you're playing fairly with the reader. You know, if this is what's ended up in the historical record, then however many dragons or zombies or secret mind-controlling plagues you're throwing in, that's the, the frame you're colouring inside the lines of. Um, and that way, kind of, it becomes a dialogue between us as a team, the readers and, and history itself um, oh, yeah. to, to kind of see how much fun you can have with what you find. Yeah, uh, I think there's probably a lot of writers who respond very well to the blank page and th th there's some pleasure to that, but I think Dave and really? I have, well, I don't know. <laughs> or is it terrifying? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dave and I have always been motivated by boundaries and rules. You know, uh, wherever that comes from, what impulse that is, we both came together out of RPGs, which have a lot of that, you know, your tabletop games are built on. These are the limits to the story that you're telling. You've got foundations and boundaries. And then how close you can get to those boundaries without straying off them is part of the fun, right? There's brinkmanship in a story like this. Uh, I'm going to assume that most people who are listening to this have read the book uh, apologies for spoilers if you have not. It's a good book. Mm -hmm. Go check it out. But um, <laughs> there's, there's... soon to be available in trade. I was gonna say, yeah. yeah, coming in January. Um, okay. th there are 
there are dinosaurs or a dinosaur in the book in the fourth issue. And as we were ramping up to it and building up to it, uh, Dave and I had a, a certain degree of apprehension about, is this too far? Is, <laughs> is this going to be the point? Everybody's going to be fine with druids and mind control potions and the occasional ghost that might be in someone's head and might just be in their imagination. But no, we've put a dinosaur in it stomping around. Either everyone's going to go, they went way too far or it's going to work. It's and, like the prehistoric shark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But everybody seemed to like it when it hit. And the point is there is a real thrill to going that close to the boundary of, oh God, it's going to tip over, it's going to tip over, to not then tip over. There, there are two things that makes me think of to jump in right which is the first is that it's not called a dinosaur it's a dragon yeah and the second is that the story man the story elegantly justifies why this t-rex is still around right like the the core conceit of the story for it yeah yeah, the core conceit basically says oh of course that's a dragon um, so while they're sitting there going, oh, I don't know, this might be too far. I'm like, no, that actually, you haven't broken any of your rules when you talk about the rules here. And the other thing that this makes me think of um, is that that's one of the great things about comics. Comics are b- definitionally a structured medium, right? And if you were doing a periodical from image and it's a 32 page self cover, you have 28 pages to tell your story. And that's a limited amount of room, right? At the most, you've got 28 pages in that issue. And one of the joys for me in comics has always been, how do you work in these constraints? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of freedom in having that, that, that frame, having that boundary, so. And just a brief reminder to everybody watching, you can put your questions in the chat and we will read those out, just FYI. Go ahead. Oh, all I was going to say is that that on that note, there's a sort of, you know, one of the, the conventions of this kind of pulp narrative is its rhythms as much, you know, there are cliffhangers that break at every individual point, be that in comics or be that in an old serial where it was in reels and done at 45 minute installments and stuff like that. Everything that apes that traditional framework still apes that structure. And what was interesting was taking a structure like that where every 28 pages, we need a cliffhanger to really reel people in of how she's going to get out of this one. And then applying that to this much removed historical context from when you typically see that structure. If you think of a fantasy story set in the 13th century with some historical basis, you sort of, I don't know, I at least imagine, and I imagine there's a lot of librarians on this call who have got a sense of that as well, is that that's 800 pages thick and crammed as the first part of a trilogy. And part of the fun of binding this to 28 page narratives is you go, no, 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 no. We're going to do this, but we're going to do this in quick, pulpy fun rhythms that people are going to be able to, to roll along with. Well, and again, you're going to, you apply the genre label and you say fantasy and I never read this as fantasy. There are elements that are fantastic, yeah. but it's, this is a pulp serial. Yeah, that's and, exactly right. And, and, and should, Im- and that's the other thing that I loved about it when it was presented to me was that it embraces those tropes at, well at the same time going, we're now going to also break their backs. Mm-hmm. Right. We're going to take some things that you have seen a million times and find the joy in them that we love, but also, you know, take away some really alarming toxicity and, and, and some of the really problematic interpretations and iterations that have existed is the benefit of being able to write in 2020, 2021. Mm-hmm. So. so how are you able to be like take that accuracy like you want to be accurate to the time period and to the structures within it um but how how do you make sure you don't go too far like how do you know that if you're being too sucked into the research and you're not making it fun and pulpy anymore i mean justin is is a easy <laughs> answer to, if it's boring he won't draw it he will yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's, no, that that's, that's, that's great. The, yeah, that's the beauty of that collaboration, right? Is that you you can give Justin and you can give um, 
our our editor uh, Alejandro Arbona, who is lurking on this call as well. Yeah, I should have Alejandro. And, and and this information and you know the problem when you're creating it right is that you you fall in love with your little darlings and you do not even see that they are your little darlings and then somebody comes along and says that won't work here's why um and that is an you know there's a conversation in the collaboration that uh, ideally in the best circumstances elevates and you end up with something that's more than the sum of its parts so hmm. yeah ostensibly that's one of the goals of co-writing is that you've got somebody to check you but Dave and I have been doing this in various capacities for a pretty long time and as a consequence um the the merger gets closer and closer every year and yeah, as you a guys, consequence you guys more do, enabling than restricting yeah you you, you have intended you you well you guys test each other you also um there's a codependency that uh, <laughs> <laughs> That, the hive mind true. gets less and less good at checking itself. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys know what you love. And every so often there is an argument about like, I know you love it. It doesn't work. Yeah. So. It's fine. The good thing about this, of course, is that you can take anything that you're really attached to and file it away and go, look, it doesn't work here. But maybe when we're doing Andalusian pirates or we're doing, you Phantom know, of the opera in Athens. Phantom of the Opera in Athens, <laughs> there'll, there'll be a place for it. Um, yeah. Looks I, like I, the librarian that says Shida El Amin is an amazing character, an amazing story, and so pleasing to the eye. This will not stay on our library shelves. Can't wait. I love the covers. Oh, that was so fantastic. That was, you know, that was Justin's design work and um, Eric Troutman, who's the, mm -hmm. does book design for everything I do at Image. <laughs> and, and, uh they were a great collaboration yeah. uh and 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 tr i trust they will continue to be um yeah uh but uh, i think look i i i i want more of these stories i want to see more of shahida um what do you want to see more in the industry in general like in terms of like what, what stories are you kind of over and what more? Well, what I have a specific more? answer to that, but I'm going to let them hit that first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. David Robert. I mean, we're, we're very new to start throwing shade at people about <laughs> what they should stop doing. No, no, I mean, that, that, that's, really that's, it feels shade. like a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Here, we're I'll, recording I'll, this I'll, conversation. Yeah, right? yeah it is. This it's going gonna, gonna gonna to be, it's going to be out there. All right. Here, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. And I say this as a primary perpetrator of this crime. Um, I want more stories that are um, uplifting and positive. Mm. Um, I want to see more stories that say, yes, things are really, really dangerous and hard now. Um, but we can get through it and get beyond it. I genuinely think that part of the problem that we are in as a society right now is that, um, you know, it's, it's a joke we say about Lazarus, right? When we started Lazarus, it was dystopian sci-fi. Now it's a documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, Ugh, it's a bummer. and I kind of wonder if we had told a different story where, you know, in 2021, oh, we had actually done what was required to arrest the rapidly declining climate and the proliferation of propaganda and the, you know, unrelenting uh, assault on intellectual rigor, on science, on fact. It, it, what we would see yeah. so it's really easy right now to tell stories where everybody ends up a corpse face down in the mud at the end it is much harder to tell a story where at the end in a meaningful believable way 
you can be uplifted and inspired and believe in doing good works and Mm. and 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 affect the world in a positive way yeah um and i think we as a culture have fallen into this trap um we don't i mean god i think we are aching for stories that have happy endings Mm -hmm. but we have come to accept stories and we tell us it's real it's not realistic to have a happy ending so we accept these stories that are unremitting un, uh, unrelentless unrelentingly bleak he said tripping over his tongue a lot mm-hmm. it's because we're not used to it <laughs> we have to yeah. trip over it yeah i think i think you captured that with this book yeah. i do too that 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 is something that i love about compass is that it is it, it is positive i mean th- that last issue is scary Mm-hmm. There's some genuine fear coming off of the end of the second last into the last issue. And yet it gives us ultimately, I think, a very heroic, uplifting, positive moving forward. It doesn't resolve everything, right? Yeah. Shahida and Ling are still going to be just messing each other up for years to come, and you know it. It's true. Yeah. And we have a couple comments that uh love lazarus and you are so right you predicted the times of today which is wild. Mm-hmm. um also chloe gives a little applause and then they also say stories that give us hope after the battle which i love you're definitely doing that uh patricia also says yes please more happy endings real life is bleak enough right now they were called funny books for a reason which is true yeah. dave and robert real quick we're, we're about to wrap up but what do you want to see in the industry today I like to see the industry. So uh, jumping off that point about kind of, uh, let's say bleakness rather than negativity, because that's that's a, a, where I think a lot of that comes from is that we live in a context where everything is incredibly overwhelming all the time. I, I, everything that is happening seems to be happening now. And that's social media and a 24 hour news cycle. And the fact that there are big events that are, that they crush in on people a little bit. I don't know, maybe that's a personal perspective. And I think part of that is that that creates a very bounded view of what the world is and what is interesting. And so even in the context of something as far flung as, as comics, where you have subject to your artist, an unlimited budget and an unlimited capacity to do anything that you want to do, there is a sense that the, uh, the only way I think some people feel they get relevance is by direct commentary. This is happening right now and whatever I'm doing right now needs to reflect that simultaneity because people will recognize in that the things that they are dealing with in their own lives. And that is, there is some vitality and some truth to that and I don't disagree with it. But what I would like to say is that, that to my view, there are some themes and some ideas and some human experiences that are sufficiently universal that comics can be unafraid to stray out of kind of this very bounded modernist oh look they're doing a take on this inside the context of this that's clever mm. that, that that is clever and it's worth doing but also i mean i think the industry can be brave enough to take hugely different perspectives and hugely different types of stories and go the audience is smart enough and genuine enough to find the emotional truth in this they'll map it back to their own lives you don't necessarily need to rip it straight from the headlines, law and order style. So I guess what I would like to see is comics to go a little bit wild again, to mm-hmm. embrace that kind of mm-hmm. unbounded possibility. You can do literally exists. anything, yeah. Anything you want to do, you can do in 22 to 28 mm-hmm. pages. Yeah. There's no, you know, you don't need to write, and I would love to write one, this is not a, a again, not throwing shade at anybody. <laughs> you Marvel don't need to write, but no, no, that's the whole point. You don't need to write a 28 page Batman story about how Batman deals with the inability of Congress to pass Build Back Better. You can write that story, but yeah. you can also write <laughs> a ton of different things that people will still resonate with and respond to. And being careful again about, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of people ask, why are a, two Australian right, white guys writing a story about a 13th century? female muslim scholar and the answer to that is because you know we have to research and we have to to 
provide fidelity to that and you have to honor it but But there's enough universalism in there that you know we feel it she is our creation there's as much of us in her as anything else and and anybody i I think readers are responding to that too is is, the 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 end the end result of it well who are you to write this is is the the answer to that is 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 the proof is in the pudding Mm -hmm. if 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 appropriate respect and effort and research if if it was honored uh, because otherwise the counterpoint of that argument is that you don't ever get to write anything except autobiography there's no such thing as fiction Mm -hmm. i can't write a story about immortals because i'm not one Mm -hmm. uh i'm not seven thousand year olds how dare i imagine what andy's pov is so uh another librarian says what a great conversation thank you all for doing these books and this library con keep on creating great work we so appreciate it which is true Dave, do you have any last comment to add to that oh just it's been kind of really exciting to have this conversation and the thing it's brought back to me is just how much fun it's been to do this book Mm -hmm. um you know compass is one of those ideas i think robert and i have been talking about on and off for as you mentioned before, over a decade now, and to see it there and out in the world and to be talking about, yeah, Fan of the Opera in Athens and the other things I could be doing is a very exciting feeling. So hopefully watch this space. Yeah. Well, all the single issues are out at your local comic book shop now and the trade comes out in January. So librarians definitely keep Should an eye on that. be soliciting this month, right? uh last well we just we're working on wrapping up february so two months so, yes, so, uh, it's already anyway it's, it's already out. solicited you can get it it's already solicited <laughs> if any of you have any questions about getting those oh. books just reach out to us and we'll we'll put you in touch with our library marketing manager um where briefly each of you where can folks find you outside of the conference in the interweb land who wants to start um, Go ahead, so, uh, the, the best places to find me, plural, uh, is uh, on Twitter, uh, where I am at Robert Rambles, where I tend to hang out on and off for, uh, for as long as you can sustain the bird sight. Uh, and quite frequently, there is a Lazarus uh, Discord server, which is a slightly more civilized place to oh, chill. Um, slightly. I doubt that. I doubt that sincerely. I, bet, uh, uh, yeah. I curate on, my Twitter pretty carefully. Yeah, no. um, you can't get me already inside the house. No, um, <laughs> or, or, always happy to be there and be found. Um, there is an email address for kind of more formal compass stuff, which is compasscomic at gmail.com, which will get both Dave and I. Um, otherwise, uh, on the street in Melbourne, Australia, if you find somebody who looks like this, pin them down and say hello uh i'm not so jaded yet that that will trouble me uh <laughs> circumstances depending uh dave what about you uh so much the same as the above and for myself on twitter it's at professor <laughs> underscore just yeah. and greg um my my White hot incandescent hatred of all things social media uh, have led me to pretty much confine myself to the Lazarus Discord. Um, you can find the QR code or the address in the back of every issue, uh, or I suppose I should say every recent issue of Lazarus. It's not simply for the book Lazarus. Um, it, it, we have forums on there uh, discussing everything in comics and movies and TV and science and tech and news. and uh and one of the reasons i like it there is that it's a curated community you have to behave and if you don't behave you don't get to speak to other human beings um you you have to mind your manners um we should do that in real life that sounds yes that that thing that sadly seems to be lacking elsewhere suddenly and then i have recently returned to instagram in my continued internal war about the need to engage somewhat on forums um, and also my hatred of Facebook and desperate desire to see uh, it fail and hope that Neil Stevenson very soon files a really crushing lawsuit against them or something. So. Cool. Yeah. So, but everybody's welcome on the Discord and, um, and genuinely it is, I think it's a very welcoming community, so. 
Cool. Thank you so much, the three of you, for being here. Thank, Thank you for writing Compass. It's excellent. And thanks to everybody else for sticking around and, and learning more about this awesome book. Yay. Yes, Library Thank you all very much. Light Library Con Live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, all. We'll do it next time.